Right, have you guys got that? Cool, so I'm gonna talk about less SaaS and more control. So if there's one thing that um, I see where Facebook is going and where I think people need to go is to focus less on shiny syndrome that comes up with different ad strategies and focus in on what really kind of brings about the big success. And you know that's something which hopefully at the end of this, you'll see why um, when we run ad accounts, we do it without the stress or with less stress and anxiety, certainly than we did before and certainly um, a lot less than what I see as well. So right now, someone somewhere is converting your prospect into a customer with Facebook ads, but doing it consistently, predictably and profitably. And they're doing more than just being able to make Facebook ads work. They're immune to shiny ads strategy, strategy syndrome. There's something I've seen from auditing hundreds of ad accounts. It's the, the amount of people that pick up new strategies from Facebook groups, from YouTube, anywhere else. And, and they're just bolting things on to create a Frankenstein system in their ad account. And it's a complete nightmare. Um, I, I saw someone recently was doing really well with their strategy, saw that you know a lot of people were uh, promoting what this other guy was doing. And he decided to change his strategy because he wanted to get even better results completely tanked his performance and he just couldn't get it back. And, and that's the problem with uh, try, trying to go beyond what you actually need to do with Facebook as well. So the problems are, for me, there's four key ones, a weak core advertising strategy. And bear in mind, like Facebook ads, it's the delivery mechanism. It's not your advertising strategy. That's the thing that you need to work on. Also wasted time in ads manager, um, chasing these hacks and, and quick wins when often they're the things that come later on when you need to optimize. Working against Facebook's machines, so if you've been following what Facebook have been doing, then they're relying more and more on machine learning, they're taking away different kinds of interests. And actually, you know, part of it is disabling in terms of the interests you can target, but a lot of it is enabling. Uh, so things like CBO, there's a lot of uh, talk about pros and cons of CBO. It's not about CBO, it's about your advertising strategy. And that kind of falls down into a lack of repeatable process. And that's actually what leads to anxiety and stress. So the anxiety comes from um, not knowing what's ahead of you and the stress is kind of what you've been through and, and the headache of trying to react and, and constantly in, in this position of reacting as well. So today, if you're running e-com ads, digital info product, local ads, affiliate CPA ads, CPA ads, and you're after stable, predictable, profitable results, that allow you to focus on business growth and serving your customers, then this is for you. This is essentially the different types of ads that I've run in the, what now, eight years of running Facebook ads. And you know, for me, it wasn't always successful, but now pretty much any niche that we take on, we just follow the basics and, and that's generally good enough to get us some significant results. And then you build on from that as well. This is not gonna help if you're new to advertising, if you don't have an existing product or service to sell, you believe Facebook ads will solve all your business problems because it won't, or if you don't care about your customer service or you prefer shortcuts with no effort. This is also a SaaS free zone. So we talked about shiny ads syndrome, uh, shiny ads strategy syndrome. This is not gonna be it. So no duplication of your ads 50 times, 20 X in your bids, buying new business managers, delaying your pixels, and definitely not sacrificing any lambs today either. So since 2014, which is when I started to have um, success with Facebook, actually the story's been the same. The same thing's gonna happen, has been happening this year. Higher costs, more competition, Facebook's about to die, algorithm problems, new ad products that they're releasing. CBO is just one of many ad products. There's story ads, there's split testing. They're always releasing new ways to sell you more inventory or just to confuse you as well. And there's always new hacks and also policy issues. If you go back five, six years, one of the biggest things that's changed is when you used to serve your ads, it used to be a lot easier to get people to buy because it wasn't such a common thing to see ads in your newsfeed. And generally, uh, whether you're drop shipping, selling a brand services or selling services and products, it used to be um, quite a novelty as much as anything else on Facebook. But nowadays, this is kind of how most people will see your ads. A lot of people have been burnt by um, fly by night Ecom brands and people taking their data and uh, selling it on. So it's getting harder and harder, not just because of Facebook and competition, but because the consumer is changing as well. So I ran a survey recently and the, the three things that came up, 
of what was holding people back. Number one was unstable yo-yo-like performance, which happens to so many people. Also the hard to understand numbers to make the right decisions for fear of breaking something. And then the difficulty in scaling, you know, you change something, you lose profits and you don't know what to do. So if that sounds familiar to you. With rising costs, more competitors, policy issues, unpredictable performance, global issues, what should you do? I'd suggest you don't cry and you follow the advice here. The solution I would suggest is stop advertising on Facebook. Hopefully that was really useful for you. And hopefully if you're still around, I'll give you the proper solution. So if you're still here, let's change that story today. Facebook ads is frustrating, let's be honest. So, you know, one of the things about Facebook that really frustrates me is they have the keys to the car. They know the engine inside out. They have great insights, but mostly it's not actionable. So recently, uh, me and my team, we sat through a Facebook webinar on what they called liquidity and how to uh, master the algorithm and stuff. The, the webinar was super complex and the white paper they shared after it was even more confusing. We actually took that and broke it down and we said, you know what, everything we do is already what Facebook recommend, but they describe it in such complex terms. It's just some engineer is sitting there saying, hey, this is how you run story ads and this is how you do CBO. It's not the real world and that's a big problem. Facebook groups contain hundreds of ideas and opinions and, and you know, it's difficult to know where you, where you turn to and who you actually trust. The majority of YouTube advice is from unprofitable amateurs. So a lot of the kind of e-com gurus and their rented Lambos and stuff like that, they'll make 500K revenue, no profit, but they'll make profit off the courses. And, that, and that's a big problem. And people un unfortunately follow them as well. And then the top 1% experts, many of them keep their secrets locked up. So it becomes a difficult uh, thing of where to go. So where do you turn? Well, fortunately, people like myself and Kat and others, we're sharing all of that. So a little bit about myself. Uh, right now, I run an agency, a Facebook ads agency. We specialize predominantly in e-com, some info products. Um, I also run digital training. So similar to CAT, we do online training, coaching events, etc. But going back and, and why I'm wearing a chef's hat in that picture, actually on stage as well as the background picture, I, I wanted to be a chef. And, and that wasn't a career that um, I unfortunately wasn't able to progress with. But really, uh, someone actually coined it a few years ago and said, actually, you're, you're a bit of a marketing chef. You come up with recipes and they work. And, and that's kind of how I see it is I love experimentation. That's where my success comes from. Um, I do a ton of testing on my own e-com store, on my own info products and stuff like that. And honestly, nine out of 10 things, they fail. But the things that work, they work really well. And that's what we amplify. That's what we share. That's what we run on our ad accounts. And that's what we share with people as well. So you know, whatever you see behind the success, there's always failure. So since 2014, I've been winning big with Facebook ads. But if you go back a few years, I, I lost two and a half thousand dollars of personal spend, not really knowing what I was doing, trying to hack things and um, probably making the same mistakes many people make as well. And then in 2014, it clicked. And you know, in, in the two years from that point, made for over $40 million client side. In 2017, started my agency. And in that time, um, we, we've driven over $50 million for clients. 2018 launched a course and since then our students have done well over 10 million. You know, the long and short is basically I've been in your shoes. I've been through the whole process and I'm in a position where right now we have the systems in place to, uh, to create that stability without getting caught up in those uh, shiny hacks. Yes, we often test them, but we test them outside of client accounts to see if they work. You know, so most things actually don't work in, in practice at, at many different levels. Just because it works for one person doesn't mean it works for everyone. And that's not something which, as, as I train my team up, team up, as we kind of work on different strategies, we, we test things for months and months and months in different niches with different spend volumes to really make sure it works before we start sharing it with other, with other people as well. And it's that kind of success that's helped me to um, gain my position with Facebook here in Europe. So um, I act as an external advisor. I'm part of some council groups product advisory groups, et cetera. Uh, back in 2015, actually following some huge success for a print on demand store, I was invited out to Menlo Park. So this is a picture of me um, talking to product managers and engineers, et cetera, and, and describing kind of how we go, went about creating ads, which you know, five years ago, we did exactly as, as I'm doing right now. And, and as I'll show you on the fundamentals as well, and fortunately, I also get to uh, attend some really cool events like this one in Fiji and get to work with people I look up to as well, which is absolutely awesome as well. So let's create a new story. Let's talk about how Facebook ads is affordable, how we can create stable ad accounts, 
profitable, scalable, easier, structured, and more predictable. Here's the problem. The Facebook ads platform, and then I share this all the time, it's like a high performance sports car. And if you got, get into this and you're just looking to start driving, you're gonna be confused at all the dials and buttons and all the things that you can do, when essentially all you wanna do is turn the car on, drive, and get to your destination. If you look at success of myself, my agency, and many other people in the similar path, it's easy to get caught up in the success stories and say, you know, in my first month of success, I did 25K, uh, did 16 million in five months, 26 and a half million in 18 months. But it's the failures that help you get there. And, you know, I've had my fair share of losses. The losses get smaller over time, but they're the things that help you build up. And for anyone that's on any part of this journey, uh, whether you're beyond where I am, if you're just getting started or somewhere in between, you, you get to kind of take those punches. You get up and you move on as well. So my question for you is, are you gunning for a big year end? 2020 has already kicked everyone's butt. I don't think anyone on the planet has not had uh, some kind of impact from it. But there's still four and a half months of good revenue left in 2020 and to still get great value out of Facebook ads as well. Q4 is coming up, biggest sales event of the year. And there's still time to make 2020 a memorable year for all the right reasons through Facebook ads as well. So hopefully you're with me on this. So let's cut to the chase. How do you get this guy to turn into this guy and create profitable ad campaigns? So what I'm going to show you here is um, this is probably one of the biggest uh, case studies we've shared recently. I think it was last year that we shared this. Um, the, the same strategies leading into Q4 that enabled us to, um, through November alone, we spent 341K on ads for an e-com store and generated 7.1 million in return. Huge return on ad spend but it's more the process that we went through that made the difference. So obviously the numbers for the client were amazing, huge profits off the back of it, but this was a high scaling campaign that was probably one of the least stressful for us to do. And it came through all the foundations that I'm gonna share with you, because if you get those right, then actually Facebook ads and media buying is so much easier as well. So part one is goal setting. Sometimes the boring stuff, um, in fact, we have, um, an ongoing joke with clients that you know they expect us to take a new ad account on and they, they, they want us to start running ads in week one it doesn't work like that especially if you want to build the strong foundations for success and it comes with setting the right expectations whether you're running your own ad accounts or, or for clients is doing that work on the goal setting and realizing that everything you do on the facebook ads platform which is that bottom layer here in this um, pyramid it's not the thing that's actually gonna drive profitability and growth for, for the business. Then you need to look at conversion rates, your sales funnel, cost per acquisition, your average order value, return, return on ad spend, and ultimately your lifetime value. And Facebook contributes to all of that, but Facebook isn't responsible for all of that. And I think one of the things I get people to understand is Facebook advertising is lead generation. It's getting the click into your site. Then beyond that, what happens is pretty much in your control and it's your responsibility to take that on as well. Um, I'm hoping a lot of you have seen this before, it's the Facebook algorithm, bid times estimated action rate plus user value. This is kind of everything you need to know when it comes to the algorithm. And you know, a lot of people will try and confuse you, try and make this seem a lot more complex than it is. But the, it boils down to a few things. If you can give Facebook what they want, which is a happy user, they'll give you what you want, which is low costs and high conversion. That's, that all comes down to how you set up your ad account and how you deliver your ads in the auction as well. So one of the things we look at is bottom up improvements. So especially for existing ad accounts, it's kind of working on those biggest opportunity areas to give you the biggest leverage. So for example, uh, we launched our own e-com brand a couple of months ago. And although we had good stability on performance, we focused on improving average order value and therefore lifetime value as well. So average order value, working on bundles, pricing, price testing, for example, and then working on the post-purchase journeys, uh, combining email, which should be like a given if you're running Facebook ads. Email is uh, the most kind of hand-in-glove channel to work alongside it, and squeezing more value out of it, and, and seeing whether you're running lead generation uh, for local ads or for info products, or if you're making direct sales for e-commerce, it's ultimately all about lead generation. It's all about getting that uh, sign up or that sale, and then it's down to you to keep monetizing that as well. Also working on retargeting, and I'll, I'll touch on kind of how we set up our funnels as well. Speeding up your website, so it's, it's often an overlooked thing. Your website experience plays a huge part 
in the user value, whether people stay on your site, how long that site takes to load, et cetera. So improving your funnel, your landing page conversion rate, they're all parts of making Facebook ads work so much better. Improving your ads funnels. So when it comes to funnels, there are two funnels that I focus on, which I'll share as well. And then comes tweaking your click-through rate, CPM and CPCs as a kind of last bit. And that's where all the kind of tweaks and hacks and things coming to Facebook ads. And then you're ready to pour more traffic into it as well. So part two is the offer build. And I'd argue that if this is all you do and you do it extremely well, you're going to be ahead of most advertisers out there. So um, I see this uh, many times. In fact, we had a client call this morning and the, the clients now between her as a co-founder and her assistant has taken an e-com store to 12 million a year. And this is just uh, someone that learned Facebook ads two years ago. We had a look at the ad account. There's so many gaps, so many opportunities, so many uh, audiences that overlap, re targeting not correctly set up. If you looked at it from a technical, does this person know Facebook ads point of view, you'd argue, well, actually they got a ton wrong, but they got a ton right because they've done 12 million revenue, uh, driving huge profits. And it's all because they've got really good at creating offers. Where I learn offer building is this guy here. Um, this guy here is David Ogilvy. Um, back in the 30s, I think early 30s, he, he, he switched from being a, uh, a sous chef and, and I think a head chef as well to actually becoming a door-to-door -door salesperson. And he was working for a company in the US called uh, AGA, A-G-A, and they create cookers. Back at a time where the US was in recession, so uh, lots of people don't want to buy a high-end cooker. Back then, I think the price was something like $1,000, which in today's value is 10K, 15K. So it was pretty high end. And he failed for many, many months, going door to door, trying to sell this um, cooker. But what he did is every time he failed, he noted it down. Why did I fail? And what could I test next time? What could I change differently? And, and within, I think, a year or so, he became Ager's top salesperson right through the depression. And he ended up writing a sales strategy document, which you can actually, I think you can still Google it and, and the PDF is still there. So if you don't do a search for David Ogilvy, uh, Ager sales manual or something like that. I read that manual, I think maybe 10 years, 15 years ago or something. And what, although it was um, written in a different time where uh, men thought differently of women and their position in society and stuff, if you look at the marketing advice inside, it, that, that for me was eye-opening. And, and it was how he really got under the skin of his avatar and how we built offers, but how we also broke down objections. And, and he got to the point where if he could get into the house and into the kitchen, he could basically convince you why you need this agar cooker. And, and that's described in detail. And it's the kind of lens that people often don't go down to finding out how to sell their product or their service. Um, you know, be, being able to really you know, don't just walk in your customer's shoes, but be in their skin, feel what they're feeling and be able to convince them in the same way you'd want to convince yourself if you're that customer. So, you know, what I'm going to share with you here, a lot of it is born from stuff that this guy was doing nearly a hundred years ago in, in terms of door-to-door -door sales, which is still applicable today. And it's because humans don't fundamentally change in the, how they react to offers, marketing messages, influence, persuasion, etc. The medium totally has changed. So from his time, we've gone from print to TV and radio to online and where we are right now. But the fundamentals of advertising and marketing stay the same. So what I've done over the last kind of couple of years is figure out how, from an advertising point of view, do you boil it down to the most simplest level? Now, one thing about me is I'm not the most intelligent guy, but the simpler I can understand something, the easier it is for me to, re to repeat and, 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 and create systems out of it. And therefore, it's easier for me to teach my team and others as well. And really, when it comes down to advertising, there are four core parts of getting your advertising right. So product, audience, offer, and funnel. Nothing to do with the advertising platform, the medium, anything like that. If you get these four right, you can sell whether it's on Facebook or Google or wherever your customers essentially are as well. Um, and this was a quote from a mastermind attendee. It's so simple, in fact, stupidly simple, that I couldn't believe it could do so much. And I want to just show you some insight into how we use that and why it is so powerful as well. So when I look at these four and I break it down, I actually grade every single client, prospect, uh, coaching client, everything like that. I grade them on the core four. I want to know out of a score of 20, where each of these four are given five points max, 
where do you currently stand? So if you're, if you're running your own offers, your own store, your own lead gen, or you're doing it for clients, it's always to look at it from this kind of lens. And, why, and what I know from having audited over 100 ad accounts is when the score is over 15, that brand, that product is ready to scale. When it's below that, it's not. And that, that's, that's kind of just proven and tested. So on the product front, do you have a clear solution or a clear opportunity? Often, um, especially when it comes to things like drop shipping or if it's a service which is um, you know, in a red ocean, there's many people offering it, it's sometimes difficult to see where your product fits in. It's either solving an existing problem or it's creating a new opportunity. And finding that out through product research, market test, um, product market fit, et cetera, is really, really important before you even jump into your ad account. In terms of your audience, do you know your audience intimately? So I just covered off uh, some of that with how David Ogilvy did it. The offer, can you match the desire and, or need to the solution opportunity? So essentially the offer sits between how well you know your audience and where your product sits in their needs or desires. And then ultimately the funnel, can you convince and convert? Can you get that click? Can you get them to stay on your page? Can you get them to become a lead or to buy? And that's as simple as it is. When you look at, and, and you know, hopefully you can go back and look at your ad accounts, look at your clients, look at your own um, businesses, break it down into these four. And, and often I, I would say that the business founder shouldn't be the person that grades it. It has to be completely impartial and honest. But if you look at this, you'll identify where your problems are and where the opportunities are from this as well. The hardest thing to do is to create offers that connect and convert. And this starts from building your ideal avatar and really stalking them, getting to know them and build audiences off the back of that as well. Linking that to your products so that you can create your messaging angles and building your ad and sales funnel to serve the right message at the right time. So if you look at the definition of offer, the two highlights here are to accept or reject as desired, something that someone wants, or provide access or an opportunity. And that's exactly how I see offers when I'm looking at Facebook ads. So an offer is not a discount, it's not a promotion, it's not thinking monetary. It's thinking about that the true meaning of offer is you offer something to someone. So when you're offering your ad in the news in the newsfeed, is the ad relevant for that person? And if it is, can you get them into your funnel? If it isn't, can you get them not to click? Because that's also as important as getting to click as well. So an offer on Facebook is supported by product, audience, and funnel. So I'll share with you a couple of case studies on how we actually bring that together and how powerful the offer is as well. So case study one is um a, a, an in-house brand that I was working at we did 26 and a half million in 18 months when i joined the brand had done uh, 800,000 in 2014 by the end of 2014 we took it to 8 million and by the end of 2015 took it to 26 and a half million and that kind of scaling caught the attention of facebook and others as well but we did that you know when i started off i i was wheel spinning with this brand trying to figure out how to keep throwing ads at the system how to hack and duplicate and stuff like that. Nothing worked until we got the offer right. And, and really the, the core of the offer was we were selling the most uniquely personalized keepsake gift for kids ever. And that became the kind of banner or the kind of brand truth behind every kind of ad and creative and landing page and campaign we came up with to sell essentially a personalized children's book. The avatar, we, we, we were searching and, and testing and things like that. And you know we were trying to sell products to parents but what we found through testing is not only will the parents buy it for their children, but it makes a great gift. And actually when people are gift buying, they're more likely to spend more money as well. And then we start to go into not just parents, but guardians, godparents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, et cetera, et cetera, to then feed that into our data. And that's what enabled us to uh, not just go, get great results in the UK as it was UK brand, but then go global and, and scale this up as well. The ads had a mix of emotional, and also functional reasons to buy. So the emotional hooks were the feeling that the child would have, the feeling of having a keepsake. My kids have it, for example, and they, they love it. They keep it as a keepsake. They don't want to open it too often because they don't want to break it or anything like that. But it's theirs. It's personal. And when, once you understand that connect, it's easier to build that offer in your top of funnel to appeal to the parent for that feeling that you're going to give this, to, to this product to someone and you're going to be the most popular adult at the party or whatever event it's for. And then kind of building that into your ad funnel. So I use a four funnel system. Uh, my top of funnel is what I call cold, then warm, and then hot, and then existing customers, which I'll cover off later on. And then building that into the journey that makes sense. And for us, that was 
uh, building in testimonials, user generated content. And then we also tested out and which, which worked for us is bulk discounts. So if you buy one, it's full price. If you buy two, you get 5% off. If you buy three, you get 10% off, et cetera. And that helps, especially with a gifting angle to bulk up our average order values, enabling us to scale as well. And then essentially building up for referrals and repurchase. Case study two, this is a brand we took to 16 million in five months. Um, and this was the case study I shared earlier. And again, the offer was the most powerful thing for us. Now, where the first case study uh, was my first kind of big, big scale up for uh, Facebook ads, I can tell you this was super, super stressful. At peak for this particular brand, we were spending $200,000 a day. Um, let me just tell you, that was probably the most stressful media buying I've ever done because when you start to see fluctuations in performance, it's the difference between gaining or losing tens of thousands of dollars uh, within an hour, uh, which is hugely stressful. But then by the time we'd kind of worked on our systems and finessed how to actually construct the offer, we did a sizable scale up in this one, but it was far less stressful this time. The offer was a brand that was selling ski wear to make you look and feel your best on the slope. We were going for people that want to look great, feel great and have functionality as well. The product was high tech ski and snowboarding apparel. The avatar was literally anyone who's a ski or snowboard fanatics. And I also found out that skiers hate snowboarders. Snowboarders hate skiers. Um, I've not done the slopes myself, but there is a, a, a big separation there as well. But generally we're after uh, adults 18 to 15. We're also appealing to children 13 to 18 to kind of nudge their parents to get them ski wear as well. And you know, I, I talk about lookalikes, interest and broad, but that's kind of neither here there. Once you understand your avatar, the ads were all about looking great and feeling great because yes, you want functional um, ski wear, you want to stay warm, you want all the pockets and all the uh, accessories, but you also want to look good as well. So it's about cool fashion, trendy, stand out. We used influencers for this as well. In the warm, we kind of pushed, uh, in particular, a stylist tool. So an, a, the ability to, um, you know, once we got you into the brand is to take you to a page on the site that allowed you to create your own style. So you could match your own goggles, um, your jacket, your trousers, etc then working on testimonials, reminders, dynamic product ads, et cetera, and then kind of working on repurchase for customers. And that made a huge difference to scaling up that brand. Then the third case study um, is more recent. This one is a mom and pop e-com store. So they approached us last year. At that point, they'd done about three to four million and, and they were doing okay. But the founder was struggling under the, the stress of running a complex account. And again, you know, when we, when we looked at where they were and kind of where we then had to take them, it was again that typical example of someone that's been influenced by lots and lots of strategies online, but they had an amazing offer. They really, really understood their customer. And to this date, um, for this brand and for this client, I've never seen at this scale, and you know, they're pushing up to um, seven, eight million, nine million a year, they have a page satisfaction score of five. So if you know what the page satisfaction score is, it's uh, the, the kind of value that you're giving post-purchase and uh, the survey sent out by Facebook, they consistently get five because they totally care about their customers. There's, there's nothing they won't do for their customers. doesn't matter how big or small the query is. And, and their end-to-end -end customer experience is amazing. Yes, their website isn't great. They've got usability issues, uh, functionality issues. The ad account when we took it over was a disaster, but they truly cared about their customer and they got their offer right as well. Their offer was nursing with stylish confidence. The product was apparel for postnatal uh, post mums. That made it easy for us to kind of target and with our kind of creatives and things like that. But essentially with their um, cre creatives, their videos, their messaging, their purpose of what they're trying to do to uh, make, make women feel normal, like breastfeeding is normal. When you're out and about, it's actually normal to do it. And it's also functional and convenient. That, that, they've done all the hard part. And actually we just did the easy part, which is improving the ad account. And essentially it's the same, same four funnel structure. So the ads were all about looking great, feeding with confidence. The cold top of funnel was cold fashion, uh, sorry, cool fashion, comfortable, caring, regular mum life, for example, and then building in testimonials, dynamic product ads to give them an idea of uh, kind of what's available. And then once they've purchased it to then kind of continue that journey and saying, hey, you can grow your wardrobe with us as well. So that made a huge difference in, in scaling them up as well. And then the other part of this is once you've got your offer is then constructing that into your ad. So this is an ad I saw, I think it was a few months ago now, 
Um, and I think the ad kind of covered off all the things that I look for in a good ad. So it, it's certainly tongue in cheek, but what I do is I use a three and ads formula. So three nudges that you need to make to get someone to take action. So the first nudge, as you can see from this um, ad is get them to take notice. And you can certainly do that uh, within this ad, then build the copy that engages them. So that's the second nudge and then get them to take action. And, and what they did here is they had a disruptive creative. They're calling out their ideal prospect in their copy. They're connecting with the pain point, literally the pain point or opportunity gain, and they created action from this as well. And a strong offer creates ad copy that converts. So when you really understand who your avatar is, what their pain points are, how to kind of hook them in, how to communicate with them, it makes copywriting so much easier as well. So the best offers appeal to the emotion-led basic human desire. So if I talk about um, you know, 100 years ago, or whenever, 1930, going door-to-door -door selling um, cookers that people really didn't need at the time, that was using sales psychology and, and marketing on, on people in, in terms of their psychology. So convincing them on what they need, whether they need it or not. And you know, there, there are ethical sides of this as well. But essentially, if you have a product or service that you know can improve someone's life, sometimes they don't need, know they need it. Sometimes they need it, but they also need convincing as well. And that's where good offers come in. For me, good offers are far more important than being good at Facebook advertising. I would argue with all the success I've had with Facebook, I'm not the greatest Facebook advertiser out there. Um, I, I see in my group, I see in my community, and even in my team, uh, some of the technical media buying that goes on is great. And, and it's not something uh, that I'm particularly amazing at, but what I am good at is give me any niche, give me a great offer, and I'll, I'll can turn that into a great campaign that will sell. And I think that's the thing that I want people to recognize is the game of Facebook advertising is not being the best technical media buyer there is, but really getting good at building offers and building your campaigns, your avatars and funnels around that, and then working on your systems to enable that to happen as well. So part three is then about funnel build. So we talk about goals, we talk, talk about offers. Now it's about getting your funnels in place. Here's an example of a funnel. You meet someone at a bar, you don't know them, before you know it, by the end of the night, you're in bed. That's a very uh, desperate funnel. And the, the, the problem is that I see this so often in ad accounts. Like this is, this is the, the um, simplest analogy I can share of the majority of ad accounts I see is literally, here's my ad, buy my product, give me money. Like that's not how advertising works. It's not how long-term relationships are developed, whether you're dating or if you're selling a product, but you need to nurture it. If you want a long-term relationship, whether it goes into uh, real life or with your customer, you have to date. Like the goal, for example, if you go on dating, the first uh, outcome that you want is that you're going to get the second date, assuming that you've had a good time. Then you want to build on from that. And, and that's kind of how I see building relationships with Facebook as well. And what I would say is the bigger the average order value, the more dating that's going to happen. So I've sold e-com, for example, four or $500. I've sold co coaching $10,000, for example it's all about nurturing that relationship and recognizing Facebook's position in that. So if you're selling super high ticket, five figures, for example, Facebook is the introductory partner. That's not necessarily the thing that's going to close. That's going to come from your emails and the, the content you're sharing and how you're kind of warming people up through it. But essentially it's, it's built around relationships as well. So when I talk about funnel types, there's two key funnel types that I focus on your campaign funnel. So what's inside your ad account, and then also your sales funnel. So first of all, this, the campaign funnel. This is what I call the four funnel system. So if you recall from the case studies earlier, we talked about cold, warm, hot, and existing. In Cat's world, that's top of funnel, mid, and bottom of funnel. This is a temperature gauge of how likely someone is to buy. So cold for me is they have not engaged. So they haven't watched a video, they haven't, they're not fans, they haven't subscribed, haven't engaged with my page or my post or they haven't clicked. So these are completely cold audiences that don't know me. So therefore, whether I'm selling my personal services or products, or if I'm selling a brand, I need to work on that relationship first. Then I build into warm. So people that have engaged, maybe they've seen the ad, for example, a video, and they've seen up to 75%. I know they've potentially watched a chunk of that video, so then I can step down and maybe be a bit more direct response. And then down to people that have actually clicked onto my site. It could be a landing page, product page, cart page, et cetera then thinking about what the right journey is for them. 
then once they've purchased is then carrying on that relationship as well until they go cold on the other side. So purchase in the last 30 days, for example, and these are just example breakdowns, purchase in the last one to three months, three to six, six months plus, depends on what you're selling, what your service area is, but using Facebook in the right way as well. So, you know, once they've purchased, you're probably using email, you might be using messenger and SMS, you can still continue using Facebook to um, share whatever is relevant around your products, new releases, uh, you know, complete that look and things like that as well. The other advantage of the four funnel system, aside from being able to um, build the right ads for the right person at the right time, is also in how you manage your budgets as well. So this example screen is um, a typical ad account. This is one of the ad accounts that we run and how the naming convention actually helps you to manage your budgets and also your targets as well. So here, for example, in this particular ad account, we spent 104K at just over 2X return on ad spend. But if you look at our kind of cold funnel, our top of funnel is converting at about one, 1.1 uh, return on ad spend, which if you look at that, you think, you know, that's not great. This ad account, um, due to offline conversion, it hits 3X ROAS. So we know as long as we're above two, with attribution, we're gonna kick on and we're gonna be quite profitable. But if all we did was just focus on top of funnel and worry about are we getting more than one at top of funnel, then we'll, we may make the wrong decision. But we know by breaking down the targets that as long as our top of funnel is a certain number, our mid funnel is a certain number, it will bottom out. So it helps to make um, budgetary decisions. So it's about like, for example, when we do our naming convention, we put the name of the funnel in and then you can just filter that and you can just analyze those ads separately. And to give you an idea for this ad account, I tallied up to look at where the spend goes. So in this example, uh, 50, 60, 70, you know, I think it was 88%, whatever it is, is, um, so I'm trying to work this out. I'll say 85%, whatever it is. That is, that is all top of funnel. And then our retargeting is only 12% of the budget, but that's where the majority of sales come in for this particular brand. And then we've got some campaigns running for existing customers. And, and this you start to build up and you understand how to, um, I guess, micromanage your ad account more efficiently. So it's not looking at the top numbers here and saying, you know, we spent 104,000, are we doing okay? I can now start breaking that down and be clear on what our trends are and where our performance is, all based on the breakdown. So we know how we're communicating up here, what our targets are, what our, what our click-through rates are like, our CPMs, et cetera. So we can start trending top of funnel separately from other parts of the funnel as well. So once we've got our ad funnels in place and, and we, you know, we've, we've got our different campaigns, interests, lookalikes, et cetera. And FYI, this is a CBO campaign. I know that uh, a lot has been talked about and shared on CBO. One thing I try and uh, direct people on is, and avoiding the whole SaaS problem, don't overly focus on should I use CBO, should I use DPA, DCO, all these kind of acronyms, lookalikes, all that kind of stuff. Get your structure right. Everything that I've talked to you about right now, I haven't even touched on ad campaign structures and stuff. They're the things that people who are novices want to jump straight into, like how many ads should I run, what kind of testing, what kind of budgets, what kind of optimization. That kind of comes after. Get your structures right in terms of understanding your offer, your avatar, and building your um, ads and your landers. And then comes what's the right structure for me. So we use CBO. We've used CBO um, as our main mechanic for delivering our budget since I think late 2018. Facebook did make it mandatory, and I'm glad they turned that around and said actually right now it's not mandatory. So you can still choose between ad set budgets or campaign budgets. We, we've tested, a few months ago, we ran, ran quite extensive tests on uh, can we get a, a, ad set budgets to perform better than CBOs? And we can't because our systems are built in such a way that they, 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 they work off the power of what CBO is there to deliver, which is to take away the headache of managing budgets. And as long as you give Facebook the right data, and I talked about the, 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 the Facebook algorithm, we work hard on giving Facebook what it needs so that we get what we get, what we, what we need in return as well. And that's what makes CBO work. If all you do is say, right, I've got a great ad, I've got a great offer, I'm gonna turn CBO on, and it's gonna be great. It's not how it works. It's about seeding CBO with everything it needs to give you stability. So even here, for example, the way we structured our lookalikes and how we split them out, how we separate lookalikes from broad and interests. If you've been through the CBO cookbook, this will all make sense. But you know, their nuances that CBO needs that ad set budgets don't need. So for example, if I had a campaign and I was running ad set budgets, 
I wouldn't worry if I've got interests and lookalikes and broad in the same campaign because that campaign has no knowledge of whatever was going on in the ad sets. Whereas with CBO, at the campaign level, it's looking across all those ad sets. So the more similar they are, the easier it is for the algorithm to run. So um, again, you know, that, that's an, an example of a Facebook product which could make or break your performance, but it's about getting the fundamentals right so that you can make the Facebook products work in your favor as well. So then I look at the sales funnel. So this is an example of a typical uh, e-com sales funnel. So cold traffic to sales page, order page, thank you page. Maybe there's some retargeting there. But to give you an example of how I kind of look at sales funnels is I'm not just looking at return on ad spend. Because if, for example, all you do is look at these two funnels and say, well, this funnel is 100%, this funnel is 400%. So clearly the funnel on the right is giving me a 4x return on my ad spend. So therefore I need to work, uh, work on trafficking this more than the other one, but it's kind of negating the fact that I, I see Facebook as a lead gen channel. In this example, the funnel on the left is actually doing a lifetime value of 400% because of the post purchase sales in place on the, on the same offers, on the same traffic, et cetera. It might be right for you, it might not be right. In this example, ultimately we're making the right, uh, same profit at the end of it, assuming the funnel on the right doesn't continue running lifetime value. But if I can get my costs down on the left-hand funnel and it can drive volume as well, then that might be better. So I might give up some ROAS on the front end in order to get as many sales as I can, knowing that my, um, you know, my post-purchase sequence, post-purchase emails are gonna bring those sales in. So that's kind of how I look at sales funnels is trying to find the right funnel. So it could be a quiz funnel. So for example, in health and beauty, for example, quiz funnels work great. Um, you know, if you're looking to uh, sell makeup, if you're looking to sell uh, hair dye and things like that, asking people like, what are your problems? What are your, um, how do you dye your, do you dye your hair? All those kind of questions can help you then seed them into the right message. Uh, maybe you just give them a free download, a free guide, or maybe you take them straight to your, your product page. Those kind of funnels uh, are things that need testing for your purposes. So it could be an advertorial. It could be, um, hey, this is Jenny from uh, New York who X, Y, Z, and this is her story. And by the way, she had this product and that's why she looks so great. Click here to see the product. That could be right for your, your thing, or, or it could be just straight to product page. That's where the funnel testing comes in. And that's really gonna be dependent on what's, what your niche is and, and what's right for your customer and really getting, up, getting under the skin of your avatar as well. Once we've done all of that, then we get into the launch. So one of the things that I guess as, as an agency that we do differently is we don't launch straight into running ads. And that's something which, uh, especially for our customers, it's something we have to really teach them on is, we do a ton of work on the foundations before we're ready to switch the ads on. And at that point, then we do all the testing. Then we're about uh, testing all the different audiences, testing different ads and finding essentially the matches. So our kind of inputs into this are the core four, which I covered off earlier, the 5W avatar. So really getting deep into uh, why people would buy and the barriers, the four funnel system and building that out into the ad account. And then what I do is push that into what I call graduation testing. So I'm not gonna cover that in too much detail right now. I know um, for a lot of you guys who've been through FATC and um, rapid fire testing and things like that, the, the premise is similar. So you're trying to test fast to find winning angles, copy, et cetera, et cetera, to get, then put those into prospecting, stabilizing and scaling. And it's just an ongoing circle. For me, testing never ends. Doesn't matter if you're doing $100 a day spend, uh, $10,000 a day spend or whatever it is, testing is continuous. And, and you know, within that, you're more likely to um, fatigue your creative than your audiences. So there's always a bias that we're always testing more, audience, uh, more ads than we are with our audiences. And that just means that that machine is constantly cycling out uh, new opportunities, new angles, et cetera. So that when we are scaling up, we can bring stability into our performance as well. Um, this is a screen, this is a, a whiteboard um, capture of um, a, 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 how I described our testing. And I thought I'd just share this with you here because this was, um, this was done ad hoc on the fly just to someone in my team, but I thought actually this, this summarizes it pretty well. So when we break down our testing, we break our testing down into the three phases. So phase one is to find new audiences. Phase one is about, uh, especially for new ad accounts or if, we, if we've got an existing ad account that needs new audiences, is to find our best creative if it's a brand new ad account that we try and create uh, creatives that we think will work and then test those with multiple audiences because the key thing about the testing phase 
is that there's no guarantee that just because one ad works with one audience, that it's going to work with the other audience. So we're always testing it. For example, if let's say you're, you're selling for a men's watch brand and you're targeting magazines, men's magazines, car brands, um, fragrance brands, etc., you might find that an ad works with a couple of those interests and it might not work with another just because that audience is slightly different. So that's what we kind of do within the audience testing. Once we've found audiences that work, then they go to phase two. So we make a um, copy of those audiences and now we start testing even more angles, more creatives, more copy, more videos, more thumbnails, et cetera. And then we go down to testing landing pages. When we find ads that work, we push those into a social proof campaign running off page post engagement to keep the likes, shares, and comments high because social proof matters when it comes to Facebook advertising, especially if you think about, uh, do I know you? Do I like you? Do I trust you? Generally, the consensus is if an ad's got a high number of um, like shares and comments it's trustworthy and people will read the comments as well and you absolutely need to keep an eye on those but where we differ is once we find winning ads we don't go into scaling we go into prospecting first and and my view of that is no matter what my daily budget is i want to make sure i can spend three to five days at that budget and be profitable so whether it's a hundred or a thousand dollars a day even if we're seeing good results i want to see consistency before i start to push those budgets up then once I've got consistency, I start with more um, uh, tentative scaling. So I might do a 20% or a 30% budget bump. I might do it one day, two days, just to see if I can maintain that. And then I go more aggressive at that point as well. And essentially, um, you know, the graphic below was then looking at how all of that is built into the ad and, you know, how, how we take our angles from our avatars and, and test each piece piece, uh, piece by piece. So if I look at the uh, main things that I test in the ad. First of all is the creative. Like that's the first thing that most people see. So whether it's a static image or a video, you need to work on that first image that people see. Then the next big thing that I test is the first few lines of the copy. Because, you know, I, 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 see, I see a lot of people, uh, especially in the info space, they'll, they'll come up with a, uh, you know, thumb stopping creative, but it just doesn't match the copy that's there. And I, I can see from the engagement, I can see how it's been constructed. They've seen best practice, which says get people to stop scrolling, but that's only part of the puzzle. You need to get people to engage and take an interest as well. Uh, for, for those of you that have uh, followed copywriting best practices, you've probably heard of the ADA funnel, attraction, interest, desire, and action. That's what I do to build into my copy. But when I'm copy testing, I test different lines for my attraction with the same interest, desire, and action build in the copy. So for each new copy that I introduce, I skim off the first few lines and test something else, test something else. And that's how my creative cycles work on. Then, then I'll test different desire portions, different um, action portions, and, and just find the best performance based on that as well. So really the, the kind of BPM method growth strategy is all about finding those repeatable systems built essentially on advertising. So we start off with a core four, we get our offer in place and build the funnels. We go through the build and test process work on stability and optimization before going to, into scale testing. At that point, we start to introduce automation. So for example, if I've got stability, then I'll build an automation role that says, if performance over the last three days is, is, is within target, and also today is doing really well, then bump up budget 30%. Like it's one of the simplest and safest rules that you can have. And then we start to build out through that, and then we look at growth. And growth and scaling can be very different things. Scaling from an ad, point, ad, ad account point of view is essentially being able to spend more money at a profitable level, but growth comes from other parts of your system. So as you start to spend more money, you have fulfillment questions, customer service, your page satisfaction score. There's many other factors that come into it as well. And you know, this graphic is an example of the, the kind of impact that you can have with this kind of scaling. These are just some of the rarest numbers and I shared it, I think last year. And then this guy kind of joined the um, group and said, I was quite apprehensive and I wanted to see if I could get those numbers and he did and he got that at scale as well. And that's when he went from uh, going into kind of hacking the ad account and trying to do um, duplicating ad sets and all this kind of stuff and going back to actually just building up his advertising and building it step by step in this way. And it makes a huge difference. This is an example of Faris actually. And, and this one um, was really interesting because he took this strategy and applied it to Snapchat. Like this is one of the things about once you get the advertising strategy on point, it will work on Facebook. It will be there for you in years to come. 
And, and this guy here has become France's number one Snapchat buyer all through the, the methods I've shared with you here. So it's about understanding what, you know, you're connecting your products or service to a consumer. It's a human on the other side. It's how you deliver that message that's gonna have the biggest impact, not your media buying skills and not the platform. So this is an absolutely, uh, this has been a SaaS free zone. Um, the Facebook products, there's so many that come out. So CBO, as I've discussed, is one of them. There's uh, stories, there's split testing, there's conversion lift studies and all this kind of stuff. The way I manage that is if a new tool, that a new product or tool comes out from Facebook, I might, um, I, I'm not one of the early adopters. So CBO, for example, I think came out back into 2017. It took me six months to even look at it. So it wasn't until mid uh, 2018 that I looked at it. And then I set aside budget on, um, I, I, can't, I can't remember which, if it was a client account or ours, and we started to test it. It's only when we uh, started to see results and then we tested it on other niches, on other uh, ad accounts, other spend levels. And we started to see that we could actually repeat that result that we stuck with it. Same thing happened with story ads. When it first came out, um, you know, we weren't seeing success with it, so we ditched it. Then you know, Facebook made lots of changes. We tried it again three to four months later and then it started to work. But it's about picking your um, opportunities and testing those things out but it all comes from once you've got your advertising platform and everything else in place, it makes it easier to test these different uh, strategies and products out from Facebook. And, and, you know, being careful about all the noise that you read about and all the different scaling strategies and all that kind of stuff. Generally, the, the people that are sharing it, they may, have, may well have had some success with it, but they probably haven't tested it fundamentally across different niches, spend levels and stuff like that. So it could be harder for you to, to get that working. What I would say is if you do see something that's worked, then follow the people you trust. So the people in your network, the people uh, that you follow online, if they're also sharing it, then it's probably something worth looking at. And that's exactly what I do as well. So hopefully that helps to explain how you can still get into the sports car of Facebook and, and still be in a position to use all the features of it, but get the fundamentals right. Get into that sports car, learn how to drive it and take it to your destination. And then you can start uh, experimenting and testing with the different features uh, within Facebook. And that's fundamentally the, the engine that um, you know, I've developed for the BPM method. And hopefully there are things that you can take out from this, especially this top part. So you know, there's a lot of uh, stuff that I could go into in the performance marketing side. I know a, a lot of it's covered in FATC, but this is really what I wanted to focus on is how we get our ad accounts right from the start. And then we actually reduce this stress and anxiety because I'd argue the performance marketing stuff, not only is it easier, it's also going to be uh, a commodity. You know, I, I still think that machine learning is going to get better. There are many platforms out there that can automate media buying. If media buying is something you're interested in taking forward, be aware that the machines are coming. Like this is where the human side of it is going to be really hard to replicate and change. And that's where I think that the big profits and uh, opportunities are going to be for agencies, freelancers, or if you're running your own uh, programs as well. So hopefully that's going to help you to um, turn Mr. Buyer into this guy here and get them throwing ads, uh, get them throwing money at your, your ads and entering your funnel and hopefully give you the ability to scale up. So that's it from me. Thank you. I've been Deepesh. And if you've got any questions, I can take them now. I'll just chime in to say that was awesome, Depesh. Thank you. No worries. Um, looks like Sarah's just popped a question in the chat here. All right, cool. <laughs> um, I'll have a look at that. She said, yeah, I, yeah you, can, you can read it out and then answer yeah, it cool. if you can. I'm sure you can. So Sarah says, uh, for CBO, do you also use the other Power 5 to get best results? Uh, audience expansion, automatic placements, DPA, et cetera. So um, audience expansion, definitely. There's no reason. Um, so when, when you say audience expansion, what I would say is it's making sure that you're using everything in your advantage for the pixel. So advanced matching, I would absolutely switch on. Um, audience expansion, that's not necessarily part of the uh, Power 5. So being able to um, expand your audiences at the ad set level. Automatic placements, I don't use that top of funnel, I'll be honest, like I don't see, uh, my, my concern is that Facebook will often drop budget in placements that are not gonna give you a return. So we start our testing with the Facebook newsfeed. If we see success there, then we'll adapt it for um, Instagram and start testing there. When we get into the middle and bottom funnel, then we start to introduce automatic placements, definitely. The other part of, um, Power five is 
um, using CBO and giving more control to the Facebook algorithm. But like I said, you need to get, get, give the right input into Facebook to be able to get that performance that you want from Facebook. So it's, you know, I, I think the Power 5 is super, um, I think it's the first time I've seen Facebook give real good raw strategy but it's overly simplified. It's like, you know, if you look at that and start applying it to your ad account and you don't have some of the fundamentals in place, 